So this is, I'm coming to the end of, of these forms. This is a chain of custody for this case. Uh, 1A is the cutting of the band-aid used for DNA. This is the laboratory's chain of custody. You will be, the laboratory chain of custody is usually terrific. The chain of custody that you guys need to worry about is from the police department. It's those chains of custodies that are so screwed up. Laboratory often keeps a really good chain of custody. So that's not something that, that we really are too concerned about, but certainly need to look at. Then you have a statistic report that's done. It's not done by a scientist with an abacus, uh, you know, sitting down and figuring this out. We put it into an FBI pop stat uh, formula and it kicks out the number, the statistical number. And in this case, uh, you, you add the, the, lo the allele from that locus and then you just keep multiplying it for every uh, location. Here we have Caucasian it, one in 32, a lot. Black, one in 195 or 198, a lot. Southwest Hispanic, a lot. We're in the quint quintillions here with 18 zeros behind our first number. Then you have your match. I, I wanted to add, this is why I picked this case, this burglary case, because you guys are going to be seeing more and more of this stuff. This is a CODIS match report. So this band-aid was sent to CODIS, uploaded into CODIS, it was run, and lo and behold, this guy hit in the system, unfortunately. Um, so this is what a CODIS match report looks like within the crime laboratory. Uh, so I look at what their target was, what their candidate was, I look at how many it was run against. This was a local system in the Arizona database, and I look at exactly how many the arrestees, uh, how many it was searched again against, how, how many people this, this target was searched against, this target profile. This is the report that goes out to the investigating officers, to the investigate, this, this is an investigative lead report saying, we ran this sample, we got a hit, now you go out and get a clean sample. Now you want to be very, very careful that they go out and get a clean sample and they don't go to the back of the lab 20 years ago where your suspect was convicted in another case and take that sample and use it. They need to go get a clean sample from the, the, the suspect that it hit. So that's the CODIS match information and it's saying go get the sample from the subject. Now, this is the technical review sheet that's at the end of all of these packets that you get. And it's a technical review and administrative review saying our scientist is the best, they get a star, they did this case right. We're checking everything off. I always look at the dates. When was this case done? When did the analyst hand it over to the technical lead and the administrative lead? In this case, it took three months to get this case reviewed. Was it over the holidays? You know, I start checking my dates because it should take no more than three days. Many laboratories say that you have a 10-day rule. Once, the, once you have it done, the report needs to be out in 10 days. I've gotten bit by that more than once, but if I had to stick with it, I expect other people to stick with it. And this was three months. That's problematic. So that's something that I would look into or did look into. This is the same case with all the forms that I went through. And this is where it got interesting for me for this case that I was working on. It was a, I had the original, obviously, but this is latex gloves and a band-aid. And then another band-aid is written under here, but it's in different handwriting. I don't know if you, can, if you can make that out. It's in different handwriting. It was in different ink. So I started to check this out a little bit because it bothered me. The laboratory, I looked at the laboratory communication logs, and it says a pair of latex gloves was found in the garage. 
a Band-Aid was found in the garage, and then there was a Band-Aid found on the bed of the, the victim's house. And it was not the victim's Band-Aid. And that's the information that the lab got from the police officer. So the lab thinks that it was all collected at the same time. I find out that the Band-Aid that they actually tested was found, set, well, at least a day later by the homeowner, collected, given to the police, and that was the Band-Aid they tested. They didn't test the Band-Aid that were collected, were collected, was collected properly, or the gloves. They tested the Band-Aid that the homeowner collected at least a day later. This is, they get one pair of gloves. I'm questioning that. I annotate this. They get one Band-Aid from inside the garage by the broken window, broken door. That's not what's tested. They, the next day, go out. They collect another bloody Band-Aid. That's the Band-Aid that was tested. Chain of custody, horrible in this case. A lot of the states, there is a presumption that if you have an alcohol concentration within a certain period of time, that that's what they were at the time of driving, but it's a rebuttable presumption. So you can bring in evidence to show they could have been lower at the time of driving, and that is a defense. So what happens in the 19 states where we have this time limit when we have a test result that is outside that window? Many states will let, many courts, many states will let the prosecution retrograde it back into within the window. So you have a statute that makes it a crime to have a BAC of 08 or above within two hours. The state, the test is more than two hours out. Let's say this test is three hours out. The state is allowed to retrograde the number back to within two hours of driving to prove that your client was guilty. Now you would think, hey, if it's a crime to have an alcohol concentration within two hours and they have a test within three hours, we're kind of done. But you would be wrong. The argument that the courts accept, and we'll talk about this in a second, is most people are fully absorbed within two hours of drinking. So everyone will be in elimination phase two hours after they're stopped. Therefore, it's fair to add two hours of elimination and have the analyst testify to that higher number. If the analyst gives a range of, of numbers, a range of elimination rates. And remember, we talked about the three. We talked about the 008, the 015, the 03. So it kind of looks like this. You have the analyst on the stand. You have this test that happened at 3.20 in the morning. And the prosecutor says, Ms. Analyst, can you tell us what the defendant's BAC was at the time of driving? And she says, no, I can't, because I don't know if, if the client was going up or down at the time of driving. It would be irresponsible of me to try to do that. Oh, can you tell us what the person's BAC was within two hours of driving? Well, yes, I can do that, because by two hours after driving, everybody is, is eliminating have to be an elimination phase. So that last hour between the two hours after driving and the test three hours after driving, they had to be eliminating so I can tell you what they were within two hours of driving. All right, so you cross-examine them and they say, no, 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 I agree with Jones and Dubowski. You can't do it to the time of driving. But it was never about driving. There's nothing magical about driving that makes us say, well, you can't do it to then, but there are other times where retrograde works just fine. There are other times where you can take this one point of data and go to an earlier point in time, and that is completely scientifically valid and completely workable. They've never said that. We still have the great language about it being a dubious practice, forensically unacceptable, not fit for a criminal court. Two problems when we try to retrograde from three hours after driving, bless you, to two hours after driving. One is the underlying assumption is this person's gonna be fully absorbed 90 minutes or, or two hours, whatever. Um, but we have Dr. Jones, 
And we had this actual study where he found a living, breathing human being who had took almost four hours to absorb the alcohol. What do we do with that? What do we do with, we know there are people out there like that. What do we do with our client? If our client is in that same position, then our client is being screwed if we're adding on drinks when they haven't peaked yet. Well, to get there, we have to assume that our client is not like this person, this Canadian police officer that Dr. Jones tested. If your client has one of these metabolisms like that Canadian police officer had, they are absolutely getting screwed because they have not gotten as high as they're going to get within three hours after drinking. The state's gonna overstate it, uh, even going back one hour to within two hours of, of driving is going to give a falsely high BAC. I think in forensic issues, people haven't necessarily made their minds or formed the worldviews about forensics, right? And then again, you, you also wanna arm those who are on your side with forensics, because it's the type of evidence that people are gonna be confused about, and it's the kind of evidence that people are gonna be on the fence about. And so you wanna arm those who are on your side as well. And so I wanna give you a couple of practical messages, a, pra a couple of practical approaches about, about dealing with it. So remember my previous slide. When, when I told you about the different issues that I might, uh, I might kind of like ferret out or get through uh, on voir dire. And so what I would do is I take these issues that I've identified, that I, I, concerns that I might have, and then use them as questions in voir dire and start voir diring on it. And so to give you an idea of the voir dire questions, I mean, one of the first things I might do is identify the CSI people is identify the CSI people, right? I ask you all at the beginning, how many people watch CSI? Would it surprise you that only one person raised their hand? That only one person out of this whole room raised their hand as being somebody who watched CSI. It didn't surprise me, I knew it. I knew that was gonna be the answer before I asked it because these are people whose heroes are law enforcement. Most of us in this room don't have law enforcement as our heroes. In fact, we view law enforcement a lot differently than being heroic, right? And so people who view law enforcement as heroes have a worldview that I don't want on my jury. So isn't it easy to ask? Because we've already been, they've already been talked to. I think prosecutors view them as being people they don't want on the jury because they think the people who are CSI watchers are going to increase their burden. They ask it all the time. They, they talk about, oh, I hate CSI. It's a terrible show. It's a show that I don't like. You know, they get, they get DNA off a fly on the wall. They come in with all these ridiculous assumptions when they talk about CSI because they think those are jurors that hurt them when it's the exact opposite, the jurors that help them. And so I think we have to identify those people. And isn't it easy to identify them? When you have the prosecutor who comes in, you can just go right behind them and say, well, ladies and gentlemen, we heard the prosecutor talk about CSI. Who here really watches CSI? And then find the CSI people. Make a note, CSI, on all of the charts. Go row by row, find those people. Now, I'm not saying you strike them just because they're watching CSI. But if it comes down when you're exercising your strikes and you, you're stuck between this person and that person and you've got somebody who watches CSI and somebody who doesn't, I'd suggest you strike the person who, went, who watches CSI first. 